And thank you for that. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. That is Jesus of Nazareth. There's been no other person that ever walked this earth that can compare to him, that can even come close to him. I want you to take your Bible, please, and turn with me to Genesis chapter 9. I invite you to open your Bible to the ninth chapter of Genesis. And in that 25th verse, it says, And he, that is Noah, said, Cursed be Canaan. By the way, that was his grandchild. That was his grandson. Cursed be Canaan. What an awful thing for a grandfather to say about his grandchild. The thing that really strikes me in this ninth chapter is the fact that other than that one curse, this whole chapter is about blessing. All blessing originates with God, and of course it consummates with God. Paul says it this way, Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. All that's good in life really represents God's blessing to you and to me. And there is nothing that God wants more than blessing to flow between him and us. God wants his blessing to flow freely in us and through us. God wants to give us blessing, and then he wants that blessing to be reciprocated back to him. Genesis chapter 9 is about those kinds of blessings. In the first 17 verses, it is God's blessing on people. In verse 18 to the end of the chapter, it is people blessing God. So we have God's blessing, and then we have blessing God. This whole chapter is about blessing. Let's look to the blesser himself as we begin. Our Heavenly Father, you are the great God, the giver of of every good and perfect gift. You are the one that we bless today, and you are the one that truly blesses us. Lord, I pray that as we open the scripture to th this morning, that you would just, you'd grip our hearts with it, and that you would uh, speak to us out of it, and that we would listen with spiritual ears, and that we'd get what you want us to get. Enlighten the minds of our understanding that we might know. Father, we thank you for all that you do. We thank you because of who you are. We pray now that Jesus would be exalted and that uh, he would be the one that would be seen and not anyone else, that we would hear him. We ask it in his name. Amen. So let's look about uh, at this chapter about God's blessing. And one of the things that becomes very clear is that while God is a just God, he's a God that loves mercy, and his mercy is precedent over his justice. God not only wishes us well as a people, but God actually imparts real goodness to us. And I'm afraid that too much of the time we don't stop to even think about the imparting of goodness to us from the very hand of God all the time. I want, to, I want you to think about God's blessing, first of all, in this way. We need it. In fact, as I see it, it's the one thing that we can't live without is the blessing of God. We need God's blessing blessing in our lives, in our world, more than anything else. It's a necessity. And it's something that every human being, whether consciously or unconsciously, desires. They desire God's blessing. They, I hope you have learned to long for the blessing of God in your own personal life. To long for God's blessing in your life more than anything else that you would want. 
because without God's blessing, our lives really are, are not worth living. We need God's blessing. We ought to desire God's blessing. But in this chapter, there is evidence of God's blessing be ob being obtained. And I want to look at how Noah and his family, in fact, all the creatures of this earth, obtained God's blessing in this chapter. Clearly, there are consequences uh, that are connected with either following or not following God. But it's also just as clear to me in the Scripture that God's blessing is not something that we earn. It's not something that will ever come to the point to deserving, or it will never be something that we accomplish greatly that will cause then God to have to bless us. God's blessing is not something that is earned. It's something that God freely pours out upon his creation. And I want you to see some of the blessing here in this passage. In the first seven verses, uh, I think I would call the blessing that God gives to this earth the authority that he puts in the hands of men, the authority that he gives to human beings. It says in verse 1, God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and every fowl of the air and upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. He goes on to say that... Uh, in verse 6, whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. We are given an assurance in these verses that there is a measure of success that comes to people that are willing to, to follow God's order. Here he talks in the first verse about the blessing of God multiplying life, life being multiplied. In fact, that uh, the last phrase of verse 1 of chapter 9, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, is an echo of chapter 1, verse 28. It's the original, uh, it's the original creation blessing that God gives to Adam and to Eve, and it involves the God-given ability for human beings to be fruitful, for human beings to reproduce themselves. You know, it's just a wrong emphasis for any government or for any organization to uh, rule or to de-emphasize the propagation of the race. The reproduction of people, that's a blessing from God. That's fruitfulness reproducing ourselves is a blessing of God in the human race. And he goes on to say, and multiply, and that is that they would repopulate the earth from these few human beings, eight of them left on the planet. They are to repopulate the entire earth. And therein is really a mandate, it's an obligation to, uh, to, uh, to prosper. It's, a, it's a, to e eliminate our unoccupied and really uncultivated areas of the earth. The, the word replenish really means to spread all over the earth. Not only repopulate it, but spread all over it. Don't cluster like they did, we'll see in chapter 11 at the Tower of Babel. But spread over the earth. That's God's plan. That's a blessed plan of God. God has brought about uh, uh, reproduction and the repopulation of the earth. It's God's idea that nations would exist, that there would be borders, that nations and ethnicities would be spread all over this planet. That's God's blessed plan for human beings. And he promises also to sustain us in second, uh, the second verse to the fourth verse, animals, uh, are given a natural fear of human beings, and then human beings are permitted to eat meat, not the blood. Remember Leviticus chapter 17, not to eat the blood, because the blood represents the life, and life is from God. 
blood and life are both from God. So they're permitted to be animals, but they're not. They must drain out the blood. Life is protected both from uh, uh, carnivore animals and uh, murderers in verses 5 and 6. The sanctity of life is seen here. Not eating the blood of the animal, uh, the life of a human being is, is sacred, as you see in these verses. It's from God. And when you attack man, you attack God in a sense. When you take a human life, in a sense, uh, you're, you're taking what belongs to God. You're taking God's place. And so what we have here in uh, verse uh, 6 especially, very clearly, is God giving or establishing government, the rule of mankind over other human beings, the establishment of government. Why? To restrain lawbreakers. I was reading in the book of Ecclesiastes, and this became very clear to me how important it is that evildoers be punished and that they be punished uh, uh, rapidly instead of uh, letting a period of time go by. It says, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of, uh, of men is fully set in them to do evil. So you see, the punishment of evil is established by God. That's what he gives government for. We read that in Romans chapter 13. It is the responsibility of government to punish evil and to reward good. That's very important, and God approves of that because God's the one that established that. So there is the blessing of God here uh, obtained in just the area of authority, but in verses 8 to 17, I'm not going to read these verses, there is also security because what God does is he makes a, a special covenant with creation. It's called the Noahic Covenant. The covenant that God made with Noah is a covenant that literally he made with all of creation. For in that covenant, if we would read those verses, God says that he would not ever again destroy the entire earth and all the life in it by a universal flood. Uh, he says that uh, from this time on, he would... Uh, watch over the earth, there would be day and night, there would be seasons that would be changing, and uh, he makes a covenant with creation, really, through Noah, that is a permanent one, that is to last for all generations. It's a covenant that really uh, envelops all human history, established right here in these verses, that give security to uh, God's creatures. And he then gives, I call it, a, uh, a, a visible flag. Uh, he puts up a flag uh, to uh, give reminder to us of this covenant that he's making with creation. It's called a rainbow. You know, it's interesting to me that God uses a rainbow, a bow, and uh, of course, a, a bow is something that is used in warfare. It's used uh, in war. A in ancient times, the bow. It was like God hung his bow on the shelf, so to speak. Uh, I'm not going to shoot this bow in a devastating universal flood, and he hangs the bow in the sky. You know, it's also interesting that there is a rainbow around the throne of God. In Revelation chapter 4, I think it's verse 6, the throne of God is described as having a rainbow around it. And you know, a rainbow, of course, is uh, variegated colors, uh, brilliant uh, variegated colors that uh, make up this rainbow. And I see this as God's visible flag of his unfailing mercy towards mankind. When you think of a rainbow, you think of beauty, but you also think of the breadth. And that's a good representation of God's mercy, of God's unfailing uh, loving kindness to creation. The beauty of it and the breadth of it 
it's higher than the heavens, the mercy of God is described. And it's, it's a visible flag from God of his peace toward humanity along these lines, that God is not out to hit you, but he really is out to hold you. That's really what this is about. I read a story about a man called R.C. Chapman. He was a devout Christian, and one day he was asked by some other believers how he was feeling, and he said, I'm burdened this morning. But his face was smiling. It was happy looking. And uh, so the person that asked him how he was feeling said, uh, uh, how can you say that, that you're terribly burdened when you're smiling like that? And he said, well, it's a wonderful burden that I have. It's an overwhelm, uh, overwhelming of the abundance of God's blessing in my life for which I can't find enough words to even express my gratitude. And he looks at their faces and they can't figure out what he's talking about. And he says, it's simply this. I'm smiling because I am referring to Psalm 68, 19, which fully describes my condition because in that verse it says that the Father in heaven reminds us that he daily loads us down with his benefits. So I'm just overburdened today. I'm burdened down. I'm burdened down with God's blessing is, is what the man was saying. And that's exactly, that's exactly what we are experiencing. God's blessing. God has that desire to bless people. He entered into this covenant with Noah and all these creatures because God really in his heart wants to bless us. God says in his heart, I want to bless you. That's what God wants to do. God doesn't want to have to punish you. God doesn't want to have to chasten his people. God wants to bless us. But I want you to look at verse 18 as we continue on here this morning. And it says, And the sons of Noah went forth of the ark. Here they are, departing from the ark that they had been in for over a year. The sons of Noah went forth from the ark, were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And then this little note. Ham is the father of Canaan. Okay? So Noah has a son named Ham. And he has a, a grandson named Canaan. He's the Ham's son. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. Okay? Think about that. From these three boys and their families, here we are today. The whole world was re repopulated by these three sons of Noah. It says in Noah, verse 20, began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, there it is again, second footnote, where, where uh, something's going on here, that uh, all the, these two other boys doesn't talk about their sons, but every time Ham's mentioned, talks about his son Canaan. So it says, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and he told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it upon their shoulders. They went backward and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke, verse 24, from his wine. He knew what his younger son had done unto him, and he said, Cursed be Canaan. Okay? Didn't say cursed be Ham but cursed be Ham's son, Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Blessed be the Lord God. I want to stop there a moment. I want to stop there on, the, on that first phrase of verse 26. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. God is the blesser. And God blesses us. But here in that 26th verse, we are told to bless God. Blessed be the God of Shem. Blessing God for being the blesser. Everyone wants God's blessing. Less people want to bless God. And yet he desires it and he's worthy of it. What do we bless God for anyway? 
Well, I think we bless God for who he is to begin with. And I can't think of a better scripture that describes who God is than the 145th Psalm. I will extol thee, O uh, my, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works, and on and on it goes. And the last verse of Psalm 145 says, Let all flesh bless the Lord. Let all flesh bless the Lord. Another psalmist says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. So God's the blesser, and God blesses us, but God wants us to bless him. Based upon him blessing us, we should reciprocate blessing to him. Bless him for who he is, but also bless God for what he does. He is the blesser for the wonderful plan that he has for humanity, because evident in these verses that we didn't read all of them, but if you read uh, uh, verse 26 through uh, 27, in those two verses, actually we uh, bring verse 25 in as well, but in those verses especially is really evident the most far-reaching prophecy, I think, in the whole Bible, or at least one of the most far-reaching. And I'll show you what I mean uh, as we look at it uh, just a little bit closer. First of all, we read the story of Noah, his disgrace. He got drunk. He was a, a, um, a, hus a farmer, and uh, he planted a vineyard. He drank of the, uh, the wine from the vineyard. He gets drunk. Someone says, a man takes a drink, and uh, if he's not careful, eventually the drink takes the man. And uh, that's what happened here at this point. And uh, then, to add insult to injury, then he's not only disgraced by his own drunkenness, by the disrespect and the dishonor of his own son, Ham, who disrespected him. It says he looked upon his father's nakedness, and the idea is not that he just accidentally looked, but he looked with satisfaction. In other words, I don't know what kind of satisfaction he got out of it. If it, uh, if he somehow he dishonored his father, okay, somehow he disrespected his father, uh, whether he mocked him for that or what, he disrespected and dishonored his dad, and uh, that became a character weakness that uh, shows up in his in his grandson, uh, or rather in his son, and then his descendants just an, an inclination to mockery and impurity. And uh, in fact, we're going to look here in these verses and see not only Noah's disgrace, but Noah's race. That is the origin of all of mankind in these verses, as well as their destiny. You know, here in these verses, really, there is a, a separation of humanity into three branches. And uh, there is the, pro the prophesied future of the human race in broad outline in these verses that uh, we're looking at, verses 25, 26, and 27. And in verse 25, the first branch is the branch of Ham, that son of, uh, of Noah. And really, one word would uh, would sum it up, and that is enslavement. And he said to Ham, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Now, Canaan, his descendants, are people that, uh, that populated Phoenicia and Can the, the land named after him, the land of Canaan. The people that Canaan had descend from him were the people of Phoenicia 
and Canaan. And Canaan was the land of promise, the land that God promised eventually to the Jewish people. And he becomes an accursed person. Canaan does. He's accursed for his immorality. And you look at that in his descendants. In Genesis chapter 15 and verse, I think it's uh, uh, 16, God tells Abraham that at a certain time, he's going to send Abraham's people, the Jewish people, into the land of Canaan, and they're going to take that land because the sin of those Canaanite people will be so full, it'll be running over and God can't take it anymore. And so this is what we're talking about here in this 25th verse. The, the, The judgment for that was that they would be, notice this, a servant of servants. In other words, the worst kind of slavery imaginable. The lowest of slavery. The worst of it. And the Phoenicians were conquered by the Romans, and the Romans terribly enslaved them. And we know that the Canaanites were both killed and enslaved by the Israelites when they took the land that God promised to them. Both uh, 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 Joshua and Solomon enslaved these descendants of Canaan. And I should make it very clear that this, uh, this segment of, of Ham's uh, descendants, Canaan, were Caucasian people. Just to set that, uh, set that straight, they were Caucasian people. They were not uh, uh, from any other race of people. And so, enslavement. Then look at verse 26, and here is the heart of it. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. You're going to find that repeated again when uh, Japheth is mentioned, Canaan shall be his servant. He's a servant of servants. What I can say about verse 26 and Shem and his descendants, the key word that sums that up to me is enrichment. Enrichment. God blesses them for blessing. Uh, God is blessed for blessing them, and they're blessing, they're to bless the, sh- the, the, the God of Shem. They're to bless Shem's God for bestowing his blessing on them. Shem has, uh, uh, has already been recognized here as having a covenant relationship with the Lord. Look at that. It says, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. And the word Lord is the covenant name for God. It's Yahweh. Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Shem. So they're already in a covenant relationship with God, the Shemites. And his blessing uh, is, uh, is possessed by them. And their blessing is tied up in their relationship, their covenant relationship with their God. And they are at the center of God's redemption plan that really develops from Genesis 3.15. Remember that verse? I will put enmity between thee and the woman, God says to Satan, the serpent, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, thou shalt, what? It, It shall bruise thy heel, thou shalt bruise his head. And so what we have here is really a further development of that. What we have here is that that seed of the woman will come through one branch of humanity, the line of Shem. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, it says. And uh, we're getting a little bit closer to how God is going to effect his redemption plan. It's going to be through the seed of a woman, and it's going to be through a certain line of one of Noah's sons. It's going to be through Shem. And by the way, Shemites, or Semitic people, are all the descendants of Abraham. Biblically, Semites are not just Jewish people. Semites are also Arab people that are the descendants of Abraham. They are from the line of Shem. I don't want to confuse anything here, but I just want you to to see that. And then also, look at verse 27. And God shall enlarge Japheth, 
and he shall dwell in the tent of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Now, there is a relationship in the root between the name Japheth and the word enlarge. And so there's a word play here. And uh, it's, it's like God is saying, I'm going, to op- I'm going to enlarge Japheth. He's going to spread out, and his name means open up. And so it's fulfilled. It's fulfilled. God blesses them, and uh, in verse 1, he says, Be fruitful, multiply, and and replenish the earth. If anyone followed that, it was the Japhethites. They multiplied and they occupied this planet from what was then India to Europe. And notice this very important uh, little line in verse 27. He, Japheth, that is his descendants, shall dwell in the tents of Shem. Shall dwell in the... They were tent dwellers. And so when you dwell in a tent with other people, when you're invited into their tent, you share hospitality. You share the blessings of the people that invite you into their tent. And so the idea here is that the Japhethites, in particular, would find the God of Shem through dwelling in the tents of Shem. They would be introduced to the blessings of Yahweh, the God, Lord God of Shem, through the Shemites. Isn't it significant? that the writer uh, of uh, the, the prophet Isaiah tells us that a Shemite people, Israel, was to be a light to the Goyim, to the Gentiles. They were to be the ones through which the nations of the earth would hear the message of Jesus the Messiah. And so that's what it means that the Japhethites would dwell in the tents of Shem. They would find the blessing of the God of Shem through these people that come through him, specifically the Jewish people who bring to us Messiah himself, who is the fulfillment of all of that light promised to the Gentiles. And uh, so, in a sense, we're indebted. We're indebted to this group of Shemite people the Jewish people, that God has chosen to bring light to the nations, light to all of the Gentiles through this Lord God of Shem. Now, it's not until after the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension and the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost when the newborn church really finally opens the tent door to the Japhethites, and to the nations. There's a great illustration of how the gospel relates to all these three sons of Noah and the people that descended from them in the book of Acts, chapter 8, 9, and 10. For example, in Acts chapter 8, we have the record of the conversion of an Ethiopian man. He would be a descendant of Ham. In Acts chapter 9, we have the record of the a conversion, or I should say the completion, of a a Jewish man. His name was Saul, who then became Paul. He was a Shemite. And then in chapter 10, well, I should say this, uh, the early Jewish believers were very hesitant to go to uh, unclean Gentiles. And you remember how, how God showed Peter that Gentiles need to, they need to be received with the Jewish, with, with the Jewish people. And so in Acts chapter 10, you have Peter. We have the record of Peter going to a Japhethite by the name of Cornelius. And uh, he and his household is saved. Point is this: all eth- ethnic people, all races of people find their salvation the same way. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We find salvation the same way in a descendant of Shem, 
Jesus the Messiah, to be specific, who is also the Savior of the world. And when you think about this, when you stop and think about this, it's so overwhelming, you have to marvel at God's plan in all of this. And really, it brings us down to, there's only two choices in life. Either you choose to live under God's curse, or you choose to live under God's blessing. And every one of us have made that choice, whether we know it or not, to either live under God's curse and to live under God's uh, blessing. To live under God's curse is simply to ignore what God says. To live under God's curse is to reject Jesus as your Savior and as your Messiah. And that's a bad choice. That's the wrong choice. That's a, that's a choice that you'll live with for all eternity. It will determine your destiny in heaven or hell. But the other choice is if you can choose to live under God's blessing. And you choose to live under God's blessing when you receive Jesus, when you seek the Lord, and uh, when you bless Israel, because the Bible says, I will bless them that bless thee, meaning the descendants of Abraham. You become a, a, a recipient of God's blessing by being a blessing to Israel. And let God use you to populate the tent, so to speak. You can be a blessing by being a person that receives the Lord Jesus and then reaches out and shares that message, and you bring others into the tent, into the tents of Shem, so to speak. You bring other people in, Jew and Gentile. In fact, the scripture says that the gospel is to the Jew first and then also to the Gentile equally. And so we have this kind of responsibility, and this all this all flows out of Genesis chapter 9. Isn't that amazing? To me, it's just astounding how God, little by little, opens up the flower a little more, shows a little more of its beauty until what, when we get to the end of the story, it's full bloom. And you fit in. You have your part. You're part of God's marvelous redemption plan. And if you haven't taken advantage, you need to today. You need to right now. So what's your choice? Have you chosen to live under the curse or live under the blessing of God? I'm sure you want to live under God's blessing. Then why not today, if you haven't already, receive him? Receive the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. He paid your sin debt. He'll forgive you on that basis if you'll come to him and ask him to do so. And then, if you are a believer, I want you to make it your habit in life to continue to seek the God of Shem, to continue to bless the God that blessed you, and live not for the blessings he gives you, but live to bless him for who he is, as well as what he does. And I hope that you'll also have a just an overflow that you can't keep this to yourself and that you will do all you can to bring others into the tent, populate the tent. And by the way, since we're indebted to the people that, uh, that uh, this tent represents, the Jewish people and the Messiah, don't forget to pay your tent rent and uh, you do your job to be a blessing to the people that God has used to be a blessing to you. So our Heavenly Father, we're thankful, we're grateful this morning that we can look into the Scripture and we can find your plan, even though it's just in, in, uh, in seed form at this point. It's beginning to open up, and we're just amazed, even at this early point. Of course, we know how it all ends, and so we're very excited to see you at work. And Lord, I'm praying for people here there might be people listening to me this morning that are from a culture that, that take curses very seriously, and they might think that they're, they're a cursed people and they don't have any hope. Oh, Lord, show them that they can come out from under a curse and step into the blessing of God himself, a personal relationship with the blesser, with God, the God of heaven, the God that made them, the God that they'll stand before one day and give an account to. May they come to know him in a personal way, through Jesus. Lord, uh, may people seek Jesus. May they, may they want to know about him, that he is the Son of God. 
people that might be listening that don't know that he's the Son of God, Lord, show, show them that Jesus is the Son of God, and he is their Savior if they will but receive him. Do this, Lord, for your great name's sake. Bring people into uh, the tents of Shem, even today, in Jesus' name. Amen.